watch a video. Really? What? I'll go to some scary movie. You like scary movies? Uh huh. What's your favorite scary movie? You sick fucks. You see me too many movies. I said, don't you blame the movies? Movies don't create psychos. Movies make psychos more creative. <laughs> Hello, Horror Hounds, and welcome to the It Slays Podcast. I'm Rowan. Hey, it's Exilia. This is Mike. And we are here for the bonus episode. And this is a special bonus episode. Our first uh, second tier Horror Hound Patreon uh, member picked a movie. And they, uh, they, yeah, they get to pick a movie that we are going to review and we're going to do the promo stuff before I say any more about that. <laughs> hey, are you interested in becoming a horror hound? Then join us at www.patreon.com slash podcast and uh, check out everything we have to offer. We have uh, cool things from podcast shoutouts to picking movies all the way to uh, maybe getting yourself a free t-shirt. So uh, if you're interested in joining us and becoming a horror hound, join us at patreon.com slash itslays podcast. Join us. Just in evil, like in this movie. <laughs> this movie that I said we'd wait to announce. <laughs> that was a teaser. Well, let's just say it now. We're doing Evil Dead. She's your girlfriend, you take care of her. Yes, very excited. Very excited to see this. Let's, uh, let's, oh, and we should say the 1981, it's not the remake. No, not Uh, that there's anything wrong with it. No, hopefully we will do that soon. Yes. Uh, But this is the original. Uh, So let's start off with uh, our experiences on this. Uh, Have we seen it before? Just what we always talk about, our general knowledge of this film. Why don't you go ahead, Mike? Okay, um, I sort of, like, when I was a teenager, of course, I, you know, started watching horror movies way before then, so I was already fairly seasoned at that point, um, and this was one of those classics that I just hadn't seen, and, you know, I was very aware of, uh, Army of Darkness, and had seen snippets of it on TV and stuff, but didn't really know anything, and, um, well, I was probably, like, 14, and we were hanging out, you know, one summer night at my best friend's house and just like eating pizza and kind of like playing games and stuff. So we rented this and uh, got the shit scared out of us. And I, at that point I found it one of the most terrifying things I had ever seen. So 
you know, that it always sort of stuck with me. And then, of course, I saw the next two after that. And the tone is significantly different. But, uh, you know, this one has always stuck with me. And it's been quite a while, probably 10 years or so since I last watched it. So this was a, a nice revisit. How about yourself, Exilia? What are your experiences with it? Well, I've seen this one probably like a handful of times. Um, the first time I ever saw it, I don't remember a lot of details, but it was in my mid-teens and Rowan made me watch Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, and Army of Darkness in one day. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much what I remember about watching this movie specifically. Like I, this one, this the, Evil Dead. This specific. Evil Dead. Yeah. Okay. Myself... Uh, I don't even know when the first time I would have saw this is. I know it would have been I was younger than I probably would have comprehended it because this is something we always owned on on VHS. So I like I probably saw this when I was like I don't know somewhere between four and eight maybe. I always called this the uh, mashed potatoes movie ever since I was a kid just because of some of the special effects. I said, oh, that looks like mashed potatoes. So that's what I always remember. Was it mashed potatoes? I I don't know. Probably. Some sort of form of food. They kind of look like grits. <laughs> We're getting right into the movie review. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a movie I, I probably see, I'd say, I'd say maybe once a year, once every couple years. It's always in rotation. Definitely like one of my favorite films, I think. So, uh, I have a lot of experience with it. And one time, uh, Rowan and I and his parents went to Las Vegas and they had, um, remember Evil Dead the musical? Oh, and yeah. if you sat in the first couple of rows, you'd get like fake blood on you. I don't remember why we didn't end up going, but we didn't go. It was expensive. I, I think. think it was expensive. Last October, Rowan and I were, um, going to Maryland for a friend of ours's wedding and... I mean, we rented a car, we had some days off, so I was like, we're going to Maryland, why don't we, like, drive all the way to Tennessee, and then back to Toronto. So we went to Tennessee, and we went to the town where, evil, like, this Evil Dead was filmed, and we kind of had intentions of going up, because the place was, like, where the cabin was, although there's not really much left of the cabin anymore, there's, like, a slab, and, like the hole they dug for the cellar and I think there's like the innards of the the fireplace left we kind of had intentions like maybe we would like go up there the the biggest thing though is that where we're not American if we got arrested for trespassing um that would like potentially affect us ever being able to go to the states again so I don't, and I found that with the It Follows thing. I was like, I do not want to get arrested after I just like talked my way back into this country. <laughs> um, I, I'm not trying to get arrested in the southern states. Yeah. Also, right like, now. It, I thought it would be a lot, like the way to the cabin was like, I thought it'd be a lot more isolated than it was. Honestly, there was like a home and like their little like, field and it was not a big field it was like a side yard and then there was like this windy road that was on a hill because it's kind of like mountainy a little bit um and it was this winding road and it's only like one way like one way traffic going one way one way going the other so unless i wanted to like park at this person who probably owns this land that had all this fucking barbed wire that said do not trespass if i didn't want to like park in their yard then i would have to park like in the road on this windy hill which also probably not the best idea like either so yeah we we went to the road that was beneath the, where the cabin was i mean it's it, a brush it, with it, fame right yeah, yeah. Really. It, it, it felt cool to be in the presence <laughs> the area well and it was interesting too because it was in october so there were like the leaves were changing and it was kind of like the same type like time of year as the movie was set also the cabin that we were staying at was about like the cabin in evil dead was about five steps above the place we were staying <laughs> <laughs> just to put that in perspective also the town that we were staying in or like i don't know if you call it a town community we stayed in a community about 20 minutes away from morristown tennessee and like they have their own chapter of the kkk so yeah it wasn't the most comfortable place i've ever been in my life <laughs> super wholesome 
Yeah. <laughs> it's a great, great place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we will get into the trailer for Evil Dead and then we will be right back. Okay, so that was the trailer. I love it. <laughs> we always love the trailer. Oh, I love it. And uh, as we said, we are talking about 1981's The Evil Dead, so I'm going to give you the uh, the quick IMDB bio for it. So if uh, for some reason you live under a rock and not a rock but a actual rock not the uh, country how would you live under the country <laughs> i guess geographically <laughs> geographically <laughs> so <thick. laughs> and you haven't seen the evil dead you can uh, get an idea of what this movie is about so the imdb write-up is five friends travel to a cabin in the woods where they unknowingly release flesh-possessing demons. And that is it. That is a very simple um, synopsis. Well, I mean, the movie is fairly simple, yeah. (laughs) Now, before we get too much into how simple or not simple this movie is, I think it's time we hit people with a little bit of Mike's keywords. Ah, yes. The good old plot keywords. Now, again, I need to reiterate that this is user-submitted keywords. (laughs) Um, That, you know, they submit so that people who are looking for a certain, I don't know, theme or aesthetic or sequence of events or what have you um, can click on and find this movie. So it really tells you a lot about the personalities and lives and perhaps kinks or psychotic breaks in the people that are watching this movie. So, um, but now with this one, because it's an older movie and it's, you know, very famous, you know, cult, there are 257. So clearly I'm not going to go through them all, but just to do a handful of them again, because this... It's, you know, it's a lens through which to view um, the the audience of this movie and uh, their expectations. So, I mean, you know, you've got a lot of the ones that you expect. Um, there's a one called Melting Face, Pretending to be Asleep, right? That's, um, okay, that's an aesthetic, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you know, Decapitated Head, Cabin in the Woods. I mean, these are, that's, you know... Okay, fine, 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 fine. Um, stop motion animation, yes, of course, that's great. Um, sexual abuse, abuse against women, and I'm like, okay, so now we're actually sort of like getting into something here. Black comedy, um, bad guys win, which I thought was very interesting. Um, you know, it's yep. Bitten by a zombie. Now, see, that's I mean, I don't. <laughs> Would you call these zombies? No, I think they're demons. But anyway, that's fine. I mean, we're sp- we're splitting hairs at that point. I was kind of wondering this because um, we were watching some things on YouTube about about Evil Dead, and people kept calling them zombies, and I was like, "Are people that are possessed zombies?" Like, I wouldn't say so. No, no, they're not. And the- and it falls yeah, through on this. I don't, I don't feel- get that. I thought they're deadites. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, whatever you call them, I don't really think zombies cuts it. But anyway. No. Um, so, you know, we've got cannibalism, bitten in the leg. Right? Okay. Boyfriend murders specific. girlfriend. Entrapment. Wooden bridge. Wall clock. You know, okay. Garden spade shovel. I mean, again, this is something that people submit so that people can find it. Like, like this is, you know, an interest. This is This is a tag. I want to see every movie with a wooden bridge in it. Oh, absolutely. A wall clock, right? Like playing cards, poked in the eye. A Caucasian. <laughs> stabbed with a pencil. Lifted by the throat, right? I mean, jewelry as gift. <laughs> Saying boo. <laughs> wow. Mm-hmm. Blood on camera lens. That's actually kind of a, a an interesting one. Interesting. I mean, at least that's aesthetic, right? River. Yeah. Dead man. Car. Stabbed in the back. (laughs) What? Tragic love. I mean, I guess that's self-cannibalism. I mean, that's, you know, maybe if you're writing a paper on self-cannibalism, that's fine. Grandfather clock. You know, attacked by a plant. Mm -hmm. Rape. Okay. (laughs) 
raped by <laughs> trees. I mean, you know, the the all those movies. The storied history of people getting raped by trees in film. I mean, it's it's giant plant, animate tree, no ending. You know, I mean, this is just <laughs> what no ending. Like watch all the movies that yeah. don't have endings. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that's just a smattering of you know the psychotic hashtags of IMDb verified users or whatever they are. And I'll be honest, I don't, if I'm looking at keywords, I feel like I probably would skip this movie because there isn't any collapsible chairs in it. No, so. there isn't. No lights that uh, turn off when when the next one's turned on. Male yeah. underwear, <laughs> you know. I don't know if I can watch this. Okay, and then we'll move on very quickly to the um, parent's guide, which, again, is an even better... It's, like, a better slice of, like, the fucking psychotic shit that goes through people's heads. Um, I get, you know. Okay, so, in terms of Parent's Guide, we have... There is a scene in which demonically possessed tree limbs are shown going up a woman's dress. Rape is implied. I'm like, <laughs> I don't think you know what the word implied means. <laughs> a man and a woman kiss for a period of time Ooh. oh my god mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. lots of blood gore pus and viscera fair enough pus yeah pus the pus really made it for me I um like the pus. but it's it's very specific some of these like um a possessed woman scratches the side of a man's face with her fingernail blood pours out of the wound <laughs> You know, I mean, it's 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 very much like, literally, this is so you don't have to watch the movie, but you know exactly what happens. You're like, yeah. okay, no, it's fine that, you know, quote, rape is implied with a tree, but we can't have any pus pouring out of someone's face after it gets scratched by a possessed woman. I feel like the descriptions are also, like, almost more visceral than the, the actual movie. movie. Oh, absolutely. Like, I mean, you know, some of it's poetry we have things like a man grabs another man's leg and begins to bite into it we see blood start to trickle out of the wound (laughs) you know for profanity we have some uses of shit one partially muted half enunciated use of fuck but it is extremely hard to hear wow okay fair i guess um (laughs) You know, so, and here's the, this is under a a section all of its own in the parent's guide called Spoilers, and it's for sex and nudity, of course. A woman is raped by demonic tree branches. The branches tear open her shirt, revealing her left breast. Then they spread her legs and another branch is thrust into the crotch area. Although this sounds shocking and disturbing, it doesn't last long and the camera cuts away as soon as the branch thrusts. Wow. wow. That's very yeah, I'm That's going very to leave it at that. Although this sounds shocking and disturbing, and it's like, uh, you know, they're just setting it up to be like, well, you know, it's not really. The, the, the tree is thrusting in her crotch area. Quote, rape is implied. <laughs> anyway, that's it for parents. I just, I can't go, there's wow. pages of it. It's, uh, there's definitely issues happening here that are bubbling to the surface this is this is um a symptom of you know a diseased brain (laughs) what i mean i think uh leaving it on uh tree rape maybe is a good uh place to enter the evil dead i mean an iconic movie an iconic scene it is indeed Uh, yeah like i mean what can you not say about this movie is really when I when I think about talking about it, it's such a big task because it's so iconic. Bruce Campbell is so iconic. And I mean this like this really influenced like the genre as a whole. Yes, and I mean it created a whole subgenre. I mean, you know, the cabin in the woods thriller. You know, be it possession, be it zombies, be it like slashers, like all that essentially like you know, really, to me, stems from this, especially, you know, anything supernatural. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, another thing that I didn't really think about till this time watching it was how influential I feel this was in terms of cinematography. Oh, absolutely. Because there's so many great angles. Like, I didn't notice all the angle work. Like, 
there very rarely is any straight shots. Like, they're always tilted at this odd angle below or above. Yeah, the point of view changes all the time. It only lasts, like, very a uh, very short amount of time, but uh, there's, like, a scene where I think it's Ash uh, is, like, walking in the hall, but they do, the like, the first-person point of view. Like, I think it only lasts, like, three seconds. But I was like, this has got to be, like, a very early example of a first-person shot where they had it so you could see his hand, like, opening a door and it looked like you were doing it. It's really interesting because I, when we were watching the stuff about the making of the movie, like... It seems like that was just a product of how low budget the movie was. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that kind of like makes it even better because it was just like apparently filming it was just like a complete nightmare. But um, like it definitely worked to the movie's advantage. Yes, yeah. I was, you know, I I said that like the kind of like DIY, you know, yeah. zero budget aspect of it um made like the set. And the surroundings and, like, the cast, all that, like, it looks real. And I guess because it was, like, location shooting, you know, mm-hmm. that's that's obviously, like, a big part of it. You know, it does, like, they look like real people. It looks like a real place. It's shot in such a way that, you know, like you said, it, the cabin, like, we've stayed in ones like that. Like, they're shitty. It's not, like, a nice cabin. Yeah. It's not a nice set that they, like, dressed up to look you know like some shithole out in the middle of nowhere like it is a shithole out in the middle of nowhere but it's so fucking skillfully done that like none of it looks cheap you know what i mean and i think a huge part of that is like the camera work and stuff like that just because he's so brilliant the only part that looks cheap is the stuff that's like low budget but it's kind of like aesthetic too because it looks like i don't know it just like adds to the movie it's kind of just like it looks like that is what it should look like. Just, like, really low budget. Like, how you're talking about the mashed potatoes. Yeah. Or whatever coming out of the arm. And, like, a part I really loved the look of, too, was towards the end. And how it's, like, I guess it is, like, stop, like, was it stop motion animation? Yeah, yeah. And how things were, like, they were, like, melting after he burns the the Book of the Dead. Um, They're, like, melting and stuff. I just, like, love the look of that. It's certainly not high budget looking, but it just kind of adds to the feel of the movie. Yeah, well, and I was going to say, like, and I mean, I think eventually, you know, and we'll probably get to it at some point in this podcast with, like, you know, what happens when you put a budget, like, when they remade it and you give it a little bit of a budget. But when I think about this, like... I just, I don't think we would have gotten the, like, we wouldn't have gotten something so iconic had it had a budget. budget. Yeah, for sure. Well, because, I mean, with the budget comes, like, uh, studio mandate and all that, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and and just everything, the the homemade aesthetic of it, to me, is is 80% of the allure of Mm -hmm. the film, is it's like, You can tell, like, I mean, these guys, when they made it, were basically, you know, they were, like, college dropouts. So, it's like, they were students, and they were just, like, making something for the love of horror. And it's like, you can just tell how much they love the genre and, like, the care put into it. You know, it's actually, and I thought about it with this rewatch, because, like I said... It's a movie I've seen hundreds of times that this is, it's actually like they, it's a pretty scary movie. Oh, it is. Like, like I think it does a very good job because when I think about low budget films, I usually like them because they're not scary and they're just kind of goofy, but this like really to me did have like some legit good scares in it. I mean, the whole atmosphere um, to me and even though, and I was going to bring this up at some point, um, even though, you know, there are moments where it seems like there are the flashes of black humor, I, I wasn't sure if that was intentional or not, or if it was just because it was so low budget and some of it just, it didn't come off, you know, the way that perhaps they wanted it to. And then they picked up on that and amplified it for the next couple of movies and it worked so well that they sort of made that their shtick i don't know or it could be potentially because i was so aware of evil dead 2 and army of darkness and you know being sort of slapsticky and 
projecting that on ever since I watched it for the first time. But I mean, even though there are those moments, I still like to me, you know, when I was growing up and I would say to people like, come over, we're going to watch Evil Dead and, you know, drink a few beers and like, you're going to be terrified. Or if somebody's like, I've never seen a movie that actually scared me or, you know, I never find movies creepy. I'd always be like, this is one of the ones we're going to watch because I did actually find it like fairly terrifying. You know, I remember the night that we watched it at my, in my friend's basement rec room, you know, going home and actually, you know, like feeling the hairs on the back of my neck stand up when I was getting ready for bed. I was just so fucking creeped out. Yeah, the, uh, I was going to say, like, I know, especially like when I was younger, but even so, you know, like I said, we, I just, we just finished watching this today when his girlfriend is like sitting in the doorway, like laughing for... 20 minutes of the film like that always creeps me out his sister like when they lock her in the cellar like all the scenes with her like all like that always creeped me out like i said it's just like it's this weird it's this weird feeling because it's like i think about the makeup done on the de- like once everyone's possessed and like when you really think about it you're like oh this like the makeup up close it, like doesn't look good like it's not you know, nothing you would see now in, like, a budget movie, but it's, like, it it works, like, just something about it works, and whenever I watch this, like, I'm just so willing to to shut off the low budgetness of it and just, like, really get into it. Yeah, I mean, it fits with the aesthetic of the movie, the effects do, to me, and, you know, like, it does not detract from it at all, it creates a consistent feeling and that way you don't get like pulled out of it like you still remain kind of like you don't have to suspend your disbelief because to me whenever i'm watching it i can always like you know feel the wind blowing and like i can smell the fucking dirty bare walls of the cabin and stuff so like to me that doesn't it doesn't bother me at all um and, and of course you know when you take it in the context of the time and the zero budget you know, it's well done when you think about it. It could have been a lot worse, but, uh, you know, they took it seriously, and, you know, I, I think it it's very effective because of that. And I think even watching it now, like, I think it's, and it, like I said, it's weird to say because uh, of how low budget it is, but, like, it really aged well. Like, I think it's just as effective now as it would have been then. Like we said before, like, it's... It's just as creepy, like... I feel like it's almost more effective now, because now that time's passed, and that, like, indie, like, 1980s, like, vintage kind of aesthetic is popular, I feel like now it's... it, It has aged better. Like, it's better now. Well, yes, because now you see all the, um, films and filmmakers that were inspired by it and are Mm -hmm. aspiring to be it and still none of them are quite as good they can't hit the mark as well because it was like lightning in a bottle you know what i mean like they just had the moment and the opportunity and the right combination of people and they did it Mm -hmm. and everybody else is just trying to recapture that you know even if you're really good you just can't like you can't force something like that you know what i mean so like i think that's why it's uh, that's you know yeah like you said why it still stands up because nobody has been able to do it quite as good as as they did well i think like a good example too like uh like exilia said earlier like we were just watching like documentaries and stuff on it to like kind of get some context for that for recording this one of the ones we watched like the, the their kind of big interview was with uh Eli Roth because Eli Roth basically talked about like this is the movie that made him want to make horror movies and made him feel like he could also make a horror movie because he was that age and you know he's like these guys made this movie for like no budget and i was gonna say he talked about how cabin fever was him literally saying like i want to make the evil dead like i want to make an evil dead cabin in the woods movie in vain of this and i mean i'm not we're not reviewing cabin or we're not reviewing cabin fever right cabin now fever, but yeah. i mean like obviously i don't think that's you know <laughs> met the success of evil dead because like you said there's just 
it's kind of like a lightning in the bottle situation. Like, I think there's just... The right combination. Right combination. I mean, and I'm sure we'll go on for a little bit, but, like, Sam Raimi, like... I mean, he's really, like, an auteur genius of our time. Uh, and, you know, many times, because I think he's he hasn't really lost a step in his age. No, not at all. So, I, I think it's just that with the combination of Bruce Campbell, because... I mean, I feel like we haven't, and I don't know if we afterwards have ever really had a male protagonist like Bruce Campbell, like, as iconic in horror. And it seems so accidental. Like, he's not somebody that I think, even in 1981, you would have um, looked at and went, this guy, no, it's not like this guy is going to be a success. You wouldn't have even said, like, this guy is going to be a massive cult figure who you know people will adore for you know 30 odd 40 years you know but here we are (laughs) like where did it come from it's just so bizarre it's you could not have predicted that and i feel like so many things had to line up for that to happen and i just find that so interesting and again like he still works consistently and he still revisits this character and it's a fucking amazing and i can't think of anybody else like you said who especially a male i mean you know you've got your scream queens um rightfully so you know people like jamie lee and all them and other culty people but like I can't think of anybody now who would have come from a movie like this in the last even 20 years who has developed the same type of following and had the same bizarrely eclectic career. There's nobody. Especially somebody so iconic. And by the way, can we just talk about how fucking foxy Bruce Campbell was in 1981? Like, you kind of forget it. (laughs) Yeah, it was was interesting because some of the... I can't remember. One of the women actor actresses um was kind of talking about that he wasn't like this like jock maybe it was anyways it was somebody that was doing the movie with him he wasn't like a jock he was kind of like more nerdy but he was handsome exactly i mean he he straddled that line you know between archetypes he was his own thing yeah yeah Yeah, and i i feel i feel too like because we slightly brushed the topic when we talk about Bruce Campbell is, like, when we bring up talking about, like, protagonists, like, this is really kind of the first, like, male protagonist. Oh, absolutely, in, yes, yeah. In horror, because we're, you know, we're kind of, at this point in time, bombarded with, like, Final Girl uh, logic, where this, that's all really that had been seen before oh yeah so i mean think about it like 1981 this is like the height of it you're what like four or five years into you know that new um horror boom and especially with slashers and stuff and it's like it's so and to me that's what's so interesting about this movie is that in putting the focus on a man and especially like an adult man you know because they're you know, they're like college age, but it's like older college age. You know, it's not high school people. These are not like teenagers and they're not adults pretending to be teenagers. It's just, it just feels so weird to say that by putting the focus on a man and having the man be the hero, that it was innovative because it sounds backwards. It sounds like you're going against the logic of like progress in society. Exactly. And like feminism. But at the same time, it was because it was played out at this point you know four or five years into the cycle of horror movies that you know you just you were probably looking at his sister and saying oh she's gonna be the final girl or whatever and you know like the two dudes are not gonna have any personality and they're gonna you know get wasted first but they don't and that's what's so cool about it you know like it actually like flipping the gender thing back to focusing on a man actually really worked in his favor you know and it, it created this unexpected um like chemistry yeah well and i was gonna say and it was like it's like really brilliant how they like straddled that line because as you know i'm as i'm listening to you like talk about that i'm thinking like how wrong that could have went and it's like they really do this good job of dealing with like Ash's character and like masculinity but it's like it's almost like very playful because he's very like goofy and it like even though 
you're supposed to be rooting for him and you know he he's do you know he's he's getting the the you know the the power and harnessing his masculinity to beat up these demons and cut the head off of his girlfriend you know i even think about like even more kind of racy scenes like where he's slapping linda when she's laughing in the doorway yeah but with it juxtaposed against all these other images of him in the movie where, like, yeah, like, he's just, like, a total mess. He's a doofus, like, anything that can go wrong basically goes wrong for him. And it's even, like, those, like, kind of little winks where, you know, it's, like, when he cuts off Linda's head and then, like, the blood just, like, pouring on to his body. And it's, like, it's very, like, 1920s, like, stoogy like yeah. kind of it's ridiculous yeah yeah like ridiculous and i just yeah like i said i think they really hovered that line very well and it didn't it just could have went wrong and they it didn't it, it worked yeah because i mean when this shit goes down he's like fuck this and scotty has to take care of everything it's not until scotty dies and he's the last one left that he's like okay well i guess i've got to take care of this shit now I also love the, like, milk that comes out of uh, Linda's face. Um, I called oh. it semen. It looks like, oh, it looked, <laughs> I was like, it looks so much just like milk. Well, I kept thinking of, like, Alien and Blade Runner and stuff, right? I was like, what is up with all the, like, white shit gushing out of, you know, severed bodies in the movies in, like, the late 70s and early 80s? Well, it, it, but, like, we keep saying, like, it's one of those things where, like, yeah, like, I thought, I'm like, there's no way this is a milk or something. But it's like... Because it is done so well, it's like, you forgive this, like, you buy it, you're like, all right, I'm on board to, you know, totally ignore this fact, and... Yep. It's like, okay, I guess when you cut the head off a demon, milk flies out of its stump of a neck. <laughs> sure. I will follow this movie logic. Yep, I don't blink, I don't question it. <laughs> horror hounds. Do you guys like horror music? I like horror music. Exilia likes horror music. We know Mike definitely loves horror music. So if you love horror music like we do, uh, join us on Spotify. Uh, we have a playlist up called the It Slays Podcast Horrific Playlist. We have some of our favorite tasty jams from some of our favorite horror movies. Uh, and we're always consistently adding to the list. And let us know. You can uh, email us or Facebook or Instagram us and let us know if there's anything we should add to the playlist. I did want to bring up, too, that I really, I I had said to Exilia as we were watching because I giggled. I enjoyed, like, uh, the beginning scene when they were, like, driving. I just said, you know, we talk about, like, time and, you know, everyone's like, oh, like, whatever's popular and, you know, the 60s will come back and the 70s. And how he was like, uh, you know, instead of like a water bottle or something, he was using a mason jar. Yes, because I'm like, is he fucking drinking moonshine in the car? <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I was wondering. I was like, is it moonshine? Is it water? Rowan was like, these fucking hipsters. Yeah, I was like, I was like, what is this, 2019? Like, I know. Wow, these... <laughs> well, listen, I mean, guys. I have mason jars for... God, yeah, I'm so. like, are these, are these, is this Exilia? Or? I have several mason jars <laughs> with handles that, you know, are, yep. you know, meant for beer and stuff. And I also, my, one of my two cocktail mixers is a fucking mason jar cocktail mixer. So I'm there making a martini with a fucking mason jar with like, <laughs> a, you know, strainer on top of it. Rowan's parents like only use mason jars and they're like mason jars. <laughs> There's <laughs> like not ones with handles. Yeah, Exclusive legit. Yeah. That um, the scene I love the scene where the car's driving through the woods. Something about I don't know. I just like something about that. I love the look of it. I love it's this huge old. I learned it's an Oldsmobile. This huge car, but it's it's this like sunshiny yellow, and I would drive that car. Yeah, and it's like the I and again because you talk about the angles and stuff like that. Like yeah. It's A, going through that tight, it's not even a road, mm -hmm. it's like a path through the woods, but it like just mm -hmm. stays kind of like that weird distance behind it and follows it, and it, it's yeah. just, it's such an unusual angle to take, you know, it, that mm -hmm. it's, you know, you feel like, ooh, I'm on a trip here, you know? 
Well, and it's such a huge car, and it is going down such, like, literally, just, like, a path. Yeah. No, I love, yeah, the angle's amazing. I love how that's shot. I feel like a a whole episode should be, like, dedicated to the, like, camera work of the Evil Dead. It's so well done. Well, that's another thing I had down, too, is, like, the very last shot where, like, the thing, whatever it is, and you, you are it, and you're, like, going from the back into the house and then through the front door and then into him. Like, I love that part. Like, that also, I love how that shot. Yeah, and I can't believe I didn't think about that because I was sitting there talking about, oh, like, it was so innovative them doing, like, the first person shot of, like, Ash opening the door. But then when I was like, wait, yeah, wait a second. Like, the entire movie, we're doing this first person shot of the evil. Mm -hmm. And, like, I think about, I think about, like, movies that I've seen that have come out, like, in, you know, in the 80s, the 90s, the two, like, how many movies have used that kind of technique now? The shaky camera, right? Like, the, sh- the yeah, the shaky camera and, like, you know, the, the first-person point of view from the evil or, like, the monster. Like, it's such a, a just a generic used thing now that, like, was brilliant of them to use... I did want to bring up, like, one of my favorite, my two favorite camera shots were, um, there was a a scene, it was after he shot through the window, and it kind of does him looking out the window, but it, the camera, like, tilts almost to, like, this weird 45 degree angle for no reason, really, other than to be on this angle, and it's just, I think it really helped with the atmosphere, because as we see later, where, you know, the evil's kind of making everything sound louder than it is, and, you know, the clocks, he's hearing, like, everything in the cottage at, like, you know, this, like, supersonic hearing. Yeah. And I think these camera angles, like, just throughout the movie, create this, this like, uneasy feeling that, you know, I think another shot was um when they he's going to uh, drive his sister out, and that bridge is up or whatever. They do some really good angle work when they're talking to each other by the car, where it's just this bizarre angles, and it just makes you feel uneasy because you like you don't really know why you're looking at this like at a ninety degree angle. Yeah, like even are. when she's leaning out of the car when he walks into the darkness, it's same thing, you know. And I, you know, made many notes about that. Like there's so many bizarre slanted angles but that that's you know they do that a lot during that scene like when she leans out it comes from behind and it's kind of like sideways and they just keep doing that and it just completely fucking disorients you and i guess that's the whole point like you don't have a minute essentially where you feel like okay i can just you know this is normal i can just watch this for like a couple minutes it's like no it's constantly just you know it's sideways and you're like fuck why is it like that like it's just putting you in that kind of like headspace where you're constantly trying to like figure it out yeah yeah exactly like i said there's like there's so much to talk about with evil dead um i do have to bring up i mean i i cringed it pained me as someone with a uh that has experienced an ankle injury that the pencil to the ankle oof they lingered on that like it wasn't just a stabbing. It was just like pulling it oh, down. Oh yeah, and, and like... it was just it went on for like four or five beats longer than it should have, which again, Perfect. you know, completely just fucking makes you uneasy, right? And it's like it's it's violent and disturbing, and anybody else would have probably cut away after you know two or three seconds, but it just like goes on just, they don't even linger on it for that long, but it's just long enough and they get just a few extra turns of the, the pencil in to, to just make you go like, Oh my God, like what is happening? I love how like the bloods and like the spider webs of blood kind of like spread. Oh yeah. Like later on when she's in bed or whatever. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've, when they, when they get stabbed, doesn't that happen too? No, that's when Ash goes in, yeah, and she's, like, asleep, she's asleep, and then he looks at her foot. Oh, and it, yeah, yeah, right. Which which is hand-drawn. They hand-drew those. Oh, really? It was beautiful. I thought it was really well done. Yeah, I, and it just, it added, like, that that aesthetic and the, the feel. Like, it looks low-budget, but it looks amazing. It's visually pleasing. 
Yeah, and it's just like I mean, clearly it's stop motion, right? Like I assume yeah, it is yeah. the same as the other. And the you know, like we were saying earlier about the even though the effects are you know no budget, we're not even gonna call them low budget. Um, and you know how they fit in with just the whole like it's a very consistent experience in the movie. Um, and I found that like the the stop motion, you know, like kind of stuttering of it and how it it kind of fucks with your sense of time for a few seconds because it's like you can just see that sort of like stopping and starting and stopping and starting of progress or like decay happening and it's just really cool because they keep showing like the clock stopping and then speeding yeah. up so it's like and you know it, like that it, it to me that fits in with the whole disorienting feeling and like the weird angles and like like time keeps stopping and starting and you know it all like he said there's an hour until sunrise but it feels like it goes on for like ever it feels like forever and i just thought that was so cool that like to me the stop motion like aesthetic really um played with that sense of time stopping and starting arbitrarily because of the presence of these demons i thought that was really cool like i said it's like i just gush about this oh absolutely i mean like there's just for for something that's so on the surface and you know like narratively simple because it is i mean the narrative like you can describe it you could go from the opening to the end and just describe what's happening you know in like three minutes realistically but yeah exactly you know there's just it's so skillfully done that you know you can just fucking gush over it like you said and pick it apart i did find which i mean you know i guess like you know, not it's not really a problem, but I thought it was kind of funny because as I was watching it, so, like, when Ash goes into the basement, and I'm like, oh, like, I can't wait for this to happen, and then I realize, like, oh, wait a second, that's Evil Dead 2, and there's, like, a lot of scenes like that where I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember when this happens, and I was like, oh, wait a second, that's Evil Dead 2. Oh, okay, I had the same problem. <laughs> yeah, because I was thinking about, like, when he walks down the stairs and, like, the demon, like, grabs his ankles and all that stuff. And then, yeah, and then I was like, oh, Evil Dead 2. And I think where they're so similar, because, I mean, essentially the second one was a remake. It's definitely, re- yeah, a remake, exactly. When I, when we had watched it that day, that's why I said, I was like, isn't this just, like, the same movie? <laughs> <laughs> but with saying that, I mean, although like, you know, and I'm sure we will review Evil Dead 2 and I will get it in my spiel, but my love of Evil Dead 2, even when I was disappointed because I was like, oh, that's Evil Dead 2, I wasn't disappointed with anything, you know, that didn't happen because this is still so well done. Even even the lighting, because I got worried as I was, you know, trying to put my critical lens on it. So, like, you know, obviously it was a low-budget film and lighting was an issue. So, like, when they're going in the basement, I'm thinking, okay, he's got the lantern. But, you know, like, this is older, so they just kind of, like, had lights on in the basement so you could see what he was doing. But then as it played out, and I'm like, actually, like, the you know, this actually really works well. Because they made sure not to light it too much so that, you know, they... They could have lit it fully, and then I could have saw everything, but they did such a good job of just making sure, like, everything looked real grungy. I thought it was really cool. They had a poster for The Hills Have Eyes down there. Yes, like, the nod to The Hills Have Eyes, which I never noticed till this viewing, and I'm like, what a what a great nod. Oh, yes, um, because I remember I had this Clive Barker horror book, which I've probably talked about a thousand times already, but I feel like it was maybe in there, because this was, like... You know, when I was a youngster and before, you know, when you have to, to like dial up to get onto the internet and if somebody went to make a phone call, it would kick you off. Um, but I feel like it was maybe in there somewhere where they said um, Sam Raimi had the torn poster of Hills Have Eyes for no discernible reason. Because why would there be a torn poster for the Hills Have Eyes in the cellar of this fucking cabin which clearly has a history of like ritual and demonic possession and murder and that anthropologist yeah that was there yeah loved the hills right i it's mean like, like it's like this academic <laughs> academics cabin 
Yeah, but then um, how in Nightmare on Elm Street 1 then, and, and this is actually, and I, I'm going to go back to my first experiences with this movie again for a moment now, so please bear with me. Um, you know, and they were mentioning then that how Wes Craven returned the favor of having his Hills Have Eyes poster in there by when Nancy is trying to stay awake, when she's barred in her house in Nightmare on Elm Street 1, and she's worried about, you know, her boyfriend Johnny Depp getting murdered because she can't you know control him um and she's lying on her bed watching this black and white movie on tv and it's the fucking evil dead and i did not know this for years oh, i awesome. saw nightmare on Elm street like you know eight thousand times before i was even 12 years old like i was obsessed i rented it you know when i was eight and like fucking taped it off i dubbed it <laughs> i'm sorry you know vhs gods i dubbed a copy of it you know would just watch it over and over and I just thought it was some random old, like, 30s movie that she was watching because it was on this shitty black and white TV. And then when I watched The Evil Dead for the first time, I was like, holy fuck, that's the movie Nancy's watching in Nightmare on Elm Street. So I had actually seen a small clip of it, and it's when, you know, near the end when he's the only one left and he's running around and trying to lock up all the doors and shut the shutters and stuff. And you're getting all those weird angles and, like, it's doing close-ups of him. And I was like, that's fucking Bruce Campbell. I had no idea. So really, I I had seen. I didn't know. Yeah, that's yeah, it's really amazing. cool, and I just thought that they did that. Like, I thought it was really cool that they did that nod to each other in their movies, because you know, I mean, even at that point, though, Wes Craven was fairly successful in the horror community. He, you know, that's it was still low budget, and he was still not like a household name by any means. So you know, it's cool that they had each other's backs. I think. Uh... Maybe, I don't know if it's an important thing to talk about, but uh, I want to know how psyched you guys would be to get a shitty necklace with a magnifying glass. Oh uh, my god. I'm going to make a really embarrassing confession and say that my plan was to go on Etsy and see if I could get one. (laughs) When I was watching, again, I haven't watched this in probably like eight or nine years at least, and... I forgot about the necklace. As soon as he took it out of the box, I was like, fuck, I love that necklace. And then I was like, you know what? Tonight when I go to bed, I'm going to lie in bed and go on Etsy. And I bet you, <laughs> I bet you 10 bucks there's either some jewelry maker who knows that they can cash in on the, you know, horror freak collector's market because, you know, they'll throw money down on anything. Or just some horror fan who's like, I'm going to, you know, use my resources and make that necklace and, you know, make recreations of, like, jewelry from horror movies. I bet you it exists. I'm 100%. And I'm not going to lie. I'm probably going to buy it. <laughs> so <laughs> I will I will they... update you if I do. <laughs> I need to know. They said they bought it at this random jewelry shop in, like, Michigan. And um, there, what was the whole plot? It was going to be, like, a plot device. Oh, yeah. So, because I didn't... Uh... I'm not doing like a whole lot of facts for this spoiler. Uh, so well, I mean, it's a bonus episode. This is just that's a right. loosey goosey shorty. Yeah, yeah. The documentary we watched, Bruce Campbell talked about that Sam Raimi went and bought it and showed it to Bruce Campbell, and Bruce Campbell was like, "This is the ugliest, stupidest he necklace." He was like, "What the fuck are you gonna?" Yeah, do with he's this? like, "What?" I, he's like, "This is stupid." And it's ugly. And basically, there was supposed to be a whole subplot where when the sun came up, the sun was going to shine through the magnifying glass Uh. and burn the book. Because of budget and stuff, they couldn't do that. But Sam was like, this has to, like, I still want this in the movie because I paid for it. And so, yeah, so it just turned into this... Present for Linda. Present for Linda. Uh, one thing I really wanted to bring up, too, was that I really, really love the ending of this because I love movies that don't end happy, which is probably why I love horror. Because, you know, I love that we get, like, the evil attacking Ash at the end, and it's just kind of like, well, that's it. And that's, like, my all-time favorite kind of ending. It's just like our anxiety is brought down and then immediately raised and then done. Oh, yeah. I I have to say I've I've got a real fucking sad soft spot for uh, you think you got away, but you're fucked, especially if it's only like one person. Like for whatever reason, if a movie ends in in that style and there's like two people or more. I'm like, oh, that sucks, but for some weird reason, to me, it's not as terrifying, but, like, when it's the one person who fucking just 
gruels through it all and just like survives by the skin of their teeth you know that just terrifies me because it's like no you're fucked and you're alone <laughs> you know like the descent oh my god the end of that is just to me one of the most terrifying endings ever one thing i have to i was kind of curious i don't know if you guys know or whatnot but i want to know so they were like they were having dinner when they were having dinner the first night I have a bone to pick with that dinner. Oh, okay. Maybe you should go first, because... When they were making the juice, when it was up close, it was bright red like blood. And then they, when they were pouring it, it was a dark purple. That's my bone to pick. <laughs> <laughs> I even rewound it just to make sure. It probably curdled. Because <laughs> it probably <laughs> took them however long to film that. And it was like... To actually do yeah, it. <laughs> probably. I was just curious what they were eating. I was like trying to see what they were eating. And it looked like a salad and craft dinner. Yeah, they definitely had craft... Well, mac and cheese. They don't have craft dinner in the state. I was going to oh. say it was like Velveeta or something. And I'm saying Velveeta. that... I have Velveeta on the mind because I had that for supper yesterday. <laughs> Velveeta mac and cheese. I'm a sucker for a packaged processed cheese substance. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm also, so don't be embarrassed by that. Okay. I, I think it's absolutely delicious. It is. I mean, you know, we come from not so auspicious backgrounds, so. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> One time when Rowan went to the States with his family, he brought back my mom a can of spray cheese, and she was like, what the fuck am I going to do with this? So then I sat in the cupboard above our, our uh, stove for like, it's probably there, to be honest. I was really hoping that when <laughs> you said that she said, what the hell am I going to do with this? He was like, well, this, and then took it and just like sprayed it directly into his mouth. <laughs> like that would have been amazing. That's why he said, <laughs> like, she didn't say, what the hell am I going to do this with this to him? But when I, I had never heard of it. And then Rowan told me how to, how to eat yeah. it. And I was like, oh my God. I was God. like super happy to find spray cheese in the States because A, they don't sell it in Canada. That's not I, a bad thing. I don't think. <laughs> no, B, I'm pretty like, I, sure that it's a health hazard. But anyway. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. But I always saw it in, uh, like, I'd see it in movies and stuff. Oh, yeah. They'd always just like, you know, some jock would be like, I'm going to yeah, put spray, spray cheese. Yeah, so I was yeah. always like, I want to try that. That's and then so I was gross. like super excited when I found it. Sue me, okay? Jeez. <laughs> Uh, is there anything else you guys want to talk about this film or? Um, well, I have lots of things, but we're going to, this is, this is a, a quickie. This is a loosey goosey episode. One thing that I just wanted to say was how I thought it was interesting that the first person to kind of notice and pay attention to it was the artist. And it, it, to me, it was important. And, you know, it showed her like, you know, kind of uh, getting minorly possessed and doing that weird rough sketch of the Book of the Dead. And I just thought it was really cool that like they it was almost like Shakespearean. It was like this artist was like a fucking prophet. And, you know, I just thought that was really interesting because, you know, a lot of times like the like like the artist like su was more aware and perceptive of like change in the evening like she kind of saw it and felt it when everybody else didn't and i just thought that was really cool because of, like you know she was a little bit more sensitive to uh you know things that were happening around her and then you know of course they didn't believe her so you know goodbye <laughs> cheryl <laughs> get into the cellar and you know they did do the women a little bit dirty in this movie I, you know, I don't I don't have many problems with bit. it. And frankly, it's so well done that it doesn't bother me that much. But, like, it just did suck that, like I said, you know, I mean, it kind of goes back earlier to how I said, you know, that kind of reversal of the normal gender roles in horror movies works because it's only in horror movies where the men kind of get cast aside and don't have characters and are not that important. You know what I mean? But... You know, that said, it, it did work because of that, but also I feel, like, uneasy sometimes because they did do the women dirty, and they got a few slaps in on them, which, you know, it was all in the name of black comedy, but it still was like, eh, I feel like maybe they would have done that a little bit differently today, but everybody seemed to be really having a good time doing that movie, so I feel like if it didn't bother them, and I don't know if it did or didn't, I'm not going to put words into their mouth, it worked, but I had issues. I feel like one of them talked about how they didn't like it. I guess, like, like we said, because we, we watched the documentary and, like, the they did interview all three actresses. And, I mean, they're all very appreciative that they were in this because none of them really did anything afterwards. Only one of them was, like, an actual actress. Yeah. 
like they had talked about like the tree rape scene and how you know that they like they weren't necessarily thrilled with that scene but it's kind of become this iconic scene so there's not really a lot they can do well, yes and it's iconic because it's so fucking disturbing yeah when ash drags linda outside i can't remember she was like complaining about it like the actress and then remember the actor was like because she was just wearing this like low cut thing and then um sam raimi after was just like oh yeah it would have been better if she was just like naked i think she was like cold or something like i can't quite remember oh yes yeah, sorry i do remember that that was about the tree rape scene. Oh, I thought it was from when no. Ash was dragging her outside. No, that was about the tree rape scene, and she... But that's a different actress. No, it was that actress that was talking about it. Lin- that didn't happen to Linda, though. Yeah, because it wasn't, it wasn't... Oh, she was just talking about her the other actress. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't really know the whole story, I guess, because in the documentary we watched following watching this... Like, Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi weren't in the documentary. It was basically people that were on the cast and the crew. And then those actresses. And I had said to Exilia that I I just... I kind of felt like none of them were really big horror fans. And they kind of appreciate the movie because it's a cult thing now. But, they you know, they just... They aren't films of the genre. So... So they're fans, of the, fans of the genre. They're not films. They're people. They have like a lot of complaints about it that I think just kind of come with the territory of a horror movie. I don't know. Tough, tough luck, I guess. I think that complaint was more about the conditions. Yeah, it was just mostly condition stuff. But to me, like, you know, the, even though the tree rape scene is, like, shocking, I still think we have to look at it in the context of they knew they were making, like, this grindhouse movie. And, you know, like Last House on the Left, you know, like I Spit on Your Grave, like, you know, th- this stuff was really, like, shock horror, <laughs> So it was, you know, stuff that they wanted to appall you and be like, I can't believe I'm watching this. Yes, yep, like the hills have eyes, which, you know, the torn poster was there. It's a signpost. This is the the type of movie that we're going for here. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) Just a reminder to follow us on all of our social media at It Slays Podcast. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, soon to be on Tumblr. Uh, of course, we're on Spotify and iTunes. And if you're adding us on iTunes, don't forget to leave us an iTunes review. Uh, it doesn't even need to be five star. We appreciate five star. But uh, the most important part is we want to hear from you. So uh, write us a uh, text review in the iTunes app, and we will make sure to give you a shout out on the podcast. Uh, every review helps as it bumps us up in the search engine and you know that's what it's all about back to the podcast but yeah so i say let's get to rating it i keep saying over and over again i feel like you could do five episodes on this and who knows maybe sometime we'll we'll revisit the evil dead uh let's start with exilia this time Oh, thanks. Um, I would give it actually a slay. I feel like it's a, it's like a classic. If you're gonna if you're gonna give people ten different horror movies to watch that have never seen a horror movie before, I feel like this movie would be in that list. And I love the aesthetic. I love how it's shot. It doesn't like drag on. I don't know. I just like really. I think it's a great movie. And I would give it a slay as well with like capital letters and exclamation marks and six pluses. Uh, Like (laughs) Exilia said, like, I think this is, there's probably something wrong with any person that this isn't in their top horror movie list. And Exilia said top 10. I'm going to say top three. Like, I feel like this is that good that it should be in, any top three list is an iconic film that's a must see to me if you if someone who's never seen horror and wants to understand horror you need to watch this movie it it kind of um just captures the spirit of independent horror movies as well i believe yeah exactly and i just to me like 
This is the perfect independent horror film. How about you, Mike? Oh, um, Slay, of course, capital S, underline, um, italics, bold. Uh, I mean, and you know, for many of the same reasons, and like I said, it is it is something, like X said, that I have shown to people who, you know, have not seen very many horror movies, and even though now, you know, rewatching it as an adult, you know, I saw it as being slightly more blackly humorous than I did when I first watched it, but like, it was viscerally terrifying to me, and I think it really effectively plays on a lot of, like, primal terrors and stuff that we have. Like, you know, it's everything about it, and, and of course it spawned that whole subgenre, but I mean, like, you know, it's being out in the middle of nowhere, and, like, just this fear of, like, fucked up things happening to your body that you can't control, and, like, being invaded, and it just so effectively grates on all those nerves you know what i mean and to me it just it's still so effective and i don't care like even though i absolutely love the remake and they did a really good job with you know a budget and a crew and like professional actors and stuff and i think that's good on a whole other level and it terrified me on a whole other level but it's just perfection it is and again and again there are flaws obviously and there are problems and you could go on for days about those but in the end I don't remember that. I, If I'm lying in bed in the dark, I think about how terrified I was of this. Now that I'm just thinking about it, didn't the three of us go see the remake in the theater? Yes. yes. We, Somebody yes. else came with us, I feel. We did indeed. Scott, maybe. Um, it was one of was the most... Scott? I think it was, actually. And it was... We won't go into it, but it was a, an absolutely <laughs> horrifying night for me, and I did not sleep at all. That's all I'm saying, but it's the same thing after I watched it for the first time, so the original. We definitely won't go into it, because I feel like that will come up at some point very soon, yep. possibly. Yeah, so let's uh, segue out of the film, and we are going to do the budget game, as always. I feel like I'm cheating, because I know what the budget was. I don't. I'll go first. Um, I'm okay, going to say... Ahead. $300,000. I would say it was supposed to be or be around 100000 but they ended up spending 500000 Okay, okay. So uh, the IMDb figures, Mike would take it. Oh, I never get the prices right on that one. <laughs> the official taking cost that they reported was 350000 We're not talking about the taking. We're no, no, the the, how, like what they reported they spent. Oh, okay. Is three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They go ahead and the movie lied. Exilio watched the documentary. Now the only reason I'm not going to go with his figure is because I was very questionable that Sam Raimi was not part of this, and this was all guys that only claimed the fame or that they were like worked on this movie, but they don't work with him anymore. <laughs> they drove the car to the. <laughs> Listen, that's essentially what it was. One of the guys... They were all friends since high school. Yeah, but one of the guys that was the transportation organizer and cook said, like, that he doesn't even work with Sam Raimi anymore. And he was like, I don't work with him anymore because he kept firing me from the movies. So he just doesn't hire me anymore. So maybe it's better off, let's just say, that you and Exilia tied. Because it could be... I'd say up to 500000 I feel like they always try to hide costs and say it didn't cost that much. So let's do the take-in. How much did it make? Hmm. Exilia. Not so smart now. No, I don't know the answer to this. Um, $2 million. I'm gonna say 8 or $9 million. Exilia would be correct if we were talking about only North America. So the overall gross... Was twenty nine point four million dollars. Now in the theater. In the theater. Now this is where the interesting part comes. Uh, I didn't write it down, but I believe it was about two point seven million is how much it made in North America, and it was considered. I mean, on the budget, it was considered. It made its money. It did what more than they thought, but it was a international smash hit overseas it made it essentially made 27 mil 
overseas compared to... Interesting. I wonder where. I'm going to take a wild guess. I mean, I think Italy was a big market. I was going to say Europe was definitely... Europe, because they did, you know, do an unofficial sequel for Evil Dead. Oh, really? Called Ghost House, which I own. Scream Factory put it out. And it has nothing to do with Evil Dead, but they just marketed it as the sequel, even though it had nothing to do with it. But it was massive overseas. And then, of course, it was a mammoth on video sales. Not right away, but it just as video sales went, it built this cult following. It's kind of notorious because Evil Dead was added on the... On the video nasties list. Oh, yeah, video nasties. The video nasties, which I really think we should do an episode where we don't review anything. We talk about video nasties. Yeah, 100%. Uh, But, yeah, it made it on the list. Uh, People were kind of disgusted at this. Um, It's still in... Don't remember where. I should have wrote it down. But this movie is actually still banned in some places. The only other real, and it's not even a fact, the only other thing I really wanted to mention is probably one of my all-time favorite movie posters. Oh, I was going to say, yes, we. it would be, be remiss if we did not just mention it once during, because I cannot think of, it's in my like top five movie posters, I think, of all time. Um, it's so fucking clean and simple and just legendary. <laughs> like, I I, I, wa- I, would get this tattooed on my body. Not because I love the movie so much, but just because it's such a beautiful, stylish piece of art. Yeah, I love it. And, and you know, maybe a little uh, influence on Witchboard 2. Oh, my God, yes. The hand coming up and... Oh, yeah. The hand coming out the, and the, the night dress, the, you know... When you were talking about how the camera kind of, like, you you see the perspective of the evil, I was like, didn't that happen in Witchboard? Like, didn't we see the perspective of, like... Oh, it, like, at least half a dozen times, yeah. yeah. It would race through the, the loft, yeah. 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 Well, in which Witchboard 2 is 90s, so I mean, we're definitely talking about filmmakers inspired by the Evil Dead. Yeah. Because, I mean, we're talking about, yeah, 10 years later. So definitely uh, inspired. Uh, We want to know how you felt about Evil Dead. Would you give it a yay, nay, or slay? What I'm curious, and I want to know anyone that doesn't like this movie, because I always hear raving reviews. We gave it raving reviews, but I've never really heard anyone that doesn't like it. And uh, so I want to know uh, if there's someone out there that doesn't like it. I need to know why in your justification. Yeah, we love dialogue. That's right. And I just want to say I saw someone that doesn't, you know, I saw that someone doesn't like it. Because I, I should bring up, I should have brought it up earlier, but... This holds a 95% on Rotten Tomatoes. So, like, you know, horror movies do not usually go past, like, 30. No, you're right. So this is, like, universally loved. So I think that's all for this bonus episode. Before we sign off, I do want to thank very much Ashton for picking this movie. Hopefully, we we talked uh, about points you wanted to hear and uh, hopefully we can continue the dialogue on our Instagram and Twitter and Facebook about Evil Dead. Because I love to talk about Evil Dead. I know Mike likes to talk about Evil Dead. And Exilia loves to talk about Evil Dead. So we want to continue the conversation. But yes, thank you for supporting us on Patreon. I, another reason, if you're not part of Patreon, to join. Because you get to pick uh, you get to pick a film for us to review. So, as always, I am Rowan. Bye, it's Exilia. This is Mike. Stay beautiful.